Hi everyone, welcome to Natural Sciences 306. I'm Dr. John Ackery, professor for this course. Um, as you know, we are not meeting physically this quarter, so I'll be doing most of my lectures on recorded videos and post the links as well as the lecture notes on Blackboard, so you can access those and review them at your leisure. Um, since we have roughly two hour class periods, or probably have about an hour and a half of video each class, so you want to budget, say, three hours each week to go over those, take notes, um, if you have any questions about something I go over in lecture, please feel free to send me an email and ask me. I want to start with just a couple things about the course this quarter. And I'm going to get into our specific assignments and kind of my approach later on today. Um, the first thing is just to reassure you there is an actual human being running the show here. This is new for all of us. You know, I've, I've taught online classes before. I've taught a lot of hybrid classes. But this is a, a new experience in doing the entire quarter just online for all of our classes. So bear with me as we go through the growing pains of trying to figure all of this out. If you have a question about how to find something or if a tool isn't working or if you have trouble accessing something, please reach out and let me know because um, chances are someone else is having the same difficulty. We will have a few class sessions, I believe five this quarter, where we'll meet as a large group via Zoom. Um, so you'll want to make sure you have the resources and I'll go over that a little bit later as well. Um, so my home department is English. My specialty is American literature. And I'm teaching this course because most of the classes that I teach are on writing skills and writing techniques. Um, specifically in my other job, I'm an academic editor. I work with a lot of clients in STEM fields, um, especially engineering and biology and chemistry and all that fun stuff. And so I've learned a lot about ex expectations in different disciplines for writing, for how you organize an argument, for what's important. And that's given me some um, insight into developing those skills. So I got it transferred over to the NSI department uh, last quarter and I've gone through this course before. So I think we're gonna um, come up with some really valuable stuff here. The way that 306 is organized across the university is there are five or six departments that have their own versions of 306. You know, I've talked English 306 version several times. And they are all theoretically focused on the same set of writing skills. But of course, they have different emphases in terms of the content, in terms of the, the kind of applications. So what I have done is aimed some of the applications towards scientific careers, that's the majority of your majors, but I know we also have people from a lot of different other areas just browsing through the class rosters, some music majors, some theater majors, some accounting majors, finance, all that stuff. And so what I try to do is balance the material that will help everybody in the class. Um, because unlike most NSI classes, I'm not gonna teach you science per se. We're gonna talk about how do you communicate scientific content? And how do you do that in a way that's effective and ethical and accurate and honest, which is a lot harder than it seems. The main principle I want to get across this quarter is that there's no such thing as letting the data speak for itself. And you'll see a lot of, especially websites, say, oh, we're just giving you the numbers. We're not trying to spin everything they're lying to you because everybody has an agenda. Everybody uses rhetoric, which is just the study of argument to make their case, to present data in a certain way, to frame it, to say, this is what you should pay attention to. This is what this means. This is why this is important. And we're gonna learn how to do that effectively and how to understand how people do that. And this is actually a really good setting to do this in because we are in the middle of a constant bombardment of news and commentary and reports on COVID-19. And a lot of that has to do with who do we trust and how do they communicate that information. Just the other day, for example, I got a little postcard mailer, looked like this, on tips for dealing with COVID-19. There's no shortage of those. And the tips themselves are pretty straightforward. We have listen, and, listen to and follow the directions of your state and local authorities. If you feel sick, stay home, don't go to work. Um, 
always practice good hygiene. Hopefully we're doing that anyway. But what struck me about this particular mailer is what it said on the front here. President Trump's coronavirus guidelines for America. You can see over here, there's a little picture of the White House and it brands it. It has the coronavirus.gov site. And that is a rhetorical choice. Somebody at some level decided it's not going to be enough or appropriate or effective for whatever reason to just say, hey, here's some advice on dealing with coronavirus. They wanted to brand this. They wanted to advertise it and market it in a certain way to see who would respond. Now, as far as I can tell, they sent this around to every single address, at least in my neighborhood. I don't know if that was a federal effort or a state effort or whatever, but someone made that call. And it's not always obvious how those calls happen, but it's if we look closely at how science is communicated, and this class is, is largely about communication, then we'll be able to see how that works and why it's important. So that will be an ongoing focus. Uh, we will read a handful of articles specifically on scientific content. We're reading one on the potential relationship between the MMR vaccine and various gastrointestinal problems in children. Um, that was a rather controversial one. We'll get to that later on. We're going to look at a psychological experiment from the 1960s that also made a lot of headlines and generated a lot of controversy. But what I want to do with this course is give you the tools to research in your own majors and ultimately your own careers, whether that's going to be going to grad school, maybe looking at a research position full time, or whether that's something completely different, and apply what you learn not just to writing, but to kind of understanding how to present data better. So as we go through our lecture material, I want you to keep that in mind. And especially if we do our discussions later on this quarter, that's gonna be an, an ongoing question. How do we understand things like the source of the data? Who is in charge here? What counts as a, a reliable or an authoritative source? And who, makes, who gets to make that distinction? because we are drowning in information about every conceivable subject, especially if you wander onto Reddit. But not all of it is reliable or effective or sometimes even serious. Um, there's a lot of satire, some of it actually good, some of it just kind of weird. And it's sometimes hard to figure out who to actually trust. So I wanna go over uh, my lecture notes now. I'm just going to talk you through some details about the course. We're going to show you some resources that are available to you as well as some of the approaches that I take to structure the course and to organize that. And we will finish up today with an overview of our specific assignments as well as some advice on how to process those. We'll go over each of the major assignments in turn as we get to them. And I'll finish up with my favorite section, how to get an A and then side 306. So let me switch over here to PowerPoint. There we go. All right, so you can see here, um, my perhaps favorite meme on understanding scientific authority, recognized experts over time. Theoretically, we trusted leading scientists in the 80s, PhD students in the 90s, media experts in the 2000s, and now, as we're running out the, the 2010s and moving to the 2020s, we're down to Karen on Facebook. And those who are actually named Karen, um, I apologize, but it's a meme, so it kind of has to be Karen. The point of this joke, of course, is that we have a much broader understanding of who is reliable, who has that expertise. And you may actually find useful information on Facebook. But you're also going to find a lot of different opinions, a lot of different perspectives, and a lot of people claiming to have some sort of scientific evidence, some sort of reliable evidence behind that. So we're going to be considering how those arguments work in both academic settings and academic communities, as well as in the public sphere. 
I mentioned, we'll go over today um, some goals for the course. I will walk you through the resources and the materials, as well as some of our major policies. And you can pull up the course syllabus that I sent you. If you didn't get that email, then you can pull, go to Blackboard and download a copy. And I want to present my model, what I call arguing like a grown up, also in our first section here before we move on to the assignments. So stand back, I'm going to try lecturing. The goal of NSI 306 is to prepare you for advanced academic and professional writing. Whatever that looks like in your field, you're going to need to do certain things like find useful sources, analyze data, figure out how that's going to apply to your problem, and present it in a way that's clear and effective for your audience. And that is a much more difficult task than it seems. So if you have taken courses like English 105, 106, or 107, some of this will be familiar. In fact, I, I teach 107, and so there's some overlap, especially in these first couple of weeks. As I mentioned, we will focus on science writing, but use this as a skills course. I'll talk about this more in the second part, but when we get to the end of the quarter, your job for the research project will be to research something recent in your specific major or your career field. So I want this to be a very practical course for you as well. We will not be having any sort of in-person contact on campus, probably, honestly, until summer, maybe. Um, it's looking increasingly like it'll be June before we're allowed to come back on campus. However, I am available by email all week. Um, I typically respond to those emails Monday to Friday from about 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. If something comes through on the weekend and it's quick, like, you know, what's do, when is this due that I can do that quickly? But if it's something like, hey, can you look over this paragraph? Or I have some concerns about this topic, then I'm likely to send you a, a note saying, I got your email. Let me get back to you on Monday when I'm uh, back in official email mode. So I'm at john.acker at csusb.edu. And I have a Google Voice account set up for text messages. Um, I like that because I can respond either from my phone or from my computer. So if you prefer that, we can do that as well. And I will also have office hours. I'll do that by Zoom using the same link on Blackboard from 4 to 6 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Those will start on April 7th. So for that stretch, at least, I will basically be at my computer available to talk to you. And I have uh, sent you an email last week on accessing Zoom. It's pretty easy. There's an, a mobile app as well as a desktop app. And it's just zoom.us or you can go to the direct link on Blackboard. We have several goals for this course. Ultimately, I want you to be stronger writers. Um, you're gonna come in here from a variety of different backgrounds. Maybe you are always good in English and you took you know, AP English in high school or you always did well in 105 to 107. Uh, maybe writing papers is that one thing that you, you can rely on to do well. That was, you know, my experience in college, I got through biology because we could write papers and do lab reports and stuff like that. If it had just been memorize stuff about biology and answer questions on the test, um, I, would, I would be okay, but I would not have come out with the A. So others of you may be coming to this class and thinking, oh no, I have to write. And well, yes, you, you do. Um, partly because this is an a college classroom and we do a lot of writing at Cal State, but also because you will need to write quite a bit in just about any career field that you choose. Um, I have worked with many of my editing clients and of course in my own career for, I've been editing for about 15 years, and the variety of stuff that they have to write and the stuff that they have to learn how to do on the job is very different from just the, the term papers that they learned in college or even graduate school. Um, one of my clients went from a, a degree in education to a position as a university dean. And now she's having to write all sorts of new stuff and figure all that out and come up with expectations. And it's not, not simple. So, even if you're heading into a field that you don't think is going to be writing heavy, it may surprise you. Uh, I remember one time uh, back when I was teaching at Ohio State, I gave my students a survey 
asked, what sort of career do you think you're going to have and how much writing do you think you're going to do in it? And one of my students wrote, I don't expect to write anything at all because I'm going to be a lawyer. Well, guess what? You're going to do that writing. It may not look like your college papers, but it will be the same type of skills. So here's what we're after specifically in this course. We'll be able to understand and produce reader-centered writing you need a variety of rhetorical tools. We'll get to those tools later on this quarter. We'll summarize, analyze, and respond effectively to a variety of texts. We'll spend a lot of time on the writing process, especially in terms of revision, editing, and assessment. You'll be doing peer workshops for each of your two major papers. I'll talk about those in a few minutes as well. We'll look at how different academic disciplines discourses which is basically the conversation that goes on and even types of writing a genre how that makes a difference in how you write and how you create knowledge and this is where i think it's helpful to have participants from a lot of different majors because if i just taught you how to write papers the way i was taught then you'd be very well equipped to write literature papers and that would be basically useless to all of you because I think we have like two English majors in the entire group. And so I want you to learn not just how to write in general, but how to write to the kind of audiences that would read your material in your major. Part of that then, we'll be looking at the major genres of academic writing. Now, we do not have the resources to simulate all the kinds of writing you'd be doing in junior and senior level coursework in your majors. I certainly don't have the expertise to tell you, you know, how to write a term paper in a senior class for music majors. I just, I have no idea. I've never taught those. I've never really taken anything beyond, I guess, music appreciation. But what I can do is share what I've learned about those genres and show you the kind of argument moves and the kind of ideas that you can use to perform those well. At the end of the quarter especially, you will also be doing a research project. For that, you will be presenting meaningful research from the past 10 years or so. You'll be dealing with both academic sources in that, in that project and non-academic sources in our earlier discussions figuring out how they work differently and how you might make arguments based on that information. For our work, we have two textbooks. The first one is called They Say, I Say. Um, we're using the fourth edition officially. A lot of the bookstores have earlier editions. The content's gonna be really similar. I think a couple of chapters are new and some of the page numbers might be different. Um, if you have a third edition, for example, maybe take a look at the table of contents um, and see what's different. There are lots of used copies floating around. There are probably some PDF copies um, around as well. I know that the Kindle has a version of They Say, I Say, and there are probably other ebook versions as well. Then our other book is a reader called Science and Society, an anthology for readers and writers. Um, this one is only available in print because the permissions are trickier for that. Um, for the companion website, I'm going to show that to you in a few minutes. The only reading we're doing from there, I will have available for you in PDF. So if you bought the new textbook, you already have access to that site. There's some good resources there. If you bought the used textbook and you like the extra resources, it's $5.95, so it's very reasonable, but if that's any sort of a hardship, you can actually do without it if you like, and I'll show you um, what's available there. Especially since this course is online, try to stay on top of your Cal State email and our website on Blackboard. We're gonna do a lot on Blackboard, and I'll show you that in a few minutes as well. Please use your official Cal State email. There are various university policies to make sure we have a record of all that. And that's what I'll be using to contact you. I realize that many of you may use another email server for your day-to-day -day stuff. I use Gmail for most of my work as well as for my editing business. 
Um, but it is helpful to have everything in one place there. There is a send email tool built into Blackboard, which I'll show you, that will let you contact me directly or contact your classmates if you need to um, get in touch with them as well. So read that every day, um, and that will help you keep on top of our requirements for the course. Resources, um, these on the screen, and I'll show you what they actually look like. Uh, we have a lot of material through campus agencies and organizations. Obviously, the physical offices are pretty much closed at this point, but they're still offering the services. So let me show you what those look like. Switch over here to the browser. Okay, so this is actually for the this first. This is our course website. Uh, it should come up with the access code, login first. If you bought a new book, there should be a little card, otherwise you can buy one here. You can enter into that, and most of the stuff is going to be practical for you is under the interactive writing exercises and the citation guidelines. These have several different quizzes and exercises to help practice your grammar. Um, for example, this one goes through like subject verb agreements and all that fun stuff that you thought you were done with in high school, but there's also lots and lots of resources. Now, I don't typically teach a lot of grammar in a course like this because everyone is at a different level and I don't want to use them a whole lot of class time just talking about commas, even though as an editor, I'm, I'm kind of legally required to talk about commas. What I might do then instead then, if I notice a problem on your rough drafts especially, I, I mark up the drafts a lot, then I will direct you to these exercises and you can practice the stuff that you're having trouble with here. We also have material on writing processes. So if you wanna uh, supplement some of the lecture material, you can go through here as well as some writing context there. And then the other thing that's helpful is the citation guidelines. I'm giving you a choice this quarter. If you prefer to write in MLA, that's the, kind of the standard for English departments. Um, you learn that and you're welcome to do that. That's sort of my, my native style. Uh, but you can also write in APA. If you've done any social science classes, you probably learned APA there. So there are guidelines in PDF form for just about everything you need to know. It's a 30 page PDF. So you should be fine getting the material there. Um, the American Psychological Association has also made the full APA manual available online for free, at least for the next month for students who are learning virtually. So I can direct you to that if you'd like the, the fuller version of that. So there's some useful material here. Um, I also have some links on Blackboard that can help with that. In terms of campus resources, the Writing Center is wonderful. It is staffed by uh, both undergraduates and graduate students. Um, most of the consultants are graduate students in our MA in Composition program. And they, you can set up appointments online because at this point, of course, all of our tutoring appointments are online. So from the main page here, you just click appointments and of course, page not found because they did the link wrong. Let's see if I can get that to come up. There we go. And you need to set up an account here. That make sure you're logged into the Cal State system already. But there are, they do Zoom account, Zoom chats. If you want to chat live, you can work by email um, and figure out how that works best for you. We also have the Services to Students with Disabilities office. Um, if you want to register with them and request accommodations, then you can talk with a counselor there and they will get in touch with me and we can figure out what's an appropriate accommodation. Um, in my experience, a lot of those have to do with kind of interactions in the physical classroom. So note taking or interpreters, stuff like that. Um, I don't know how relevant that will be with virtual classrooms, but I'm sure they have some resources there. So you can go through their website and I've linked you to that on the lecture notes as well. Uh, let's see. Here we go. 
Um, this is the IPS website on student resources for virtual learning. I sent you an email about this earlier as well. The library is lending out laptops. If you need one, um, especially because our computer labs are closed for the quarter, then you can talk to them and figure out when to pick that up. I would do that sooner rather than later. Um, there are various internet hotspots being set up in parking lots. So you can stay in your car and practice social distancing. And we are using Zoom. So you may want to do one of these uh, conferencing sessions just to get a sense of how this works. We will have five Zoom sessions over the course of the quarter. So I would help to do one of those trainings before that as well. And we also have various other training sessions. And finally, this is our Blackboard page. Let me go into the student preview because it works a little bit differently on your end. So um, over here on the right, you have your to-do list. Now, I'm recording this ahead of time, so nothing's on there for this week yet. But if we went to April 7th, our first day of class, then you see we have a syllabus quiz due. And that should take you right to the link there. We can actually take that. We won't do that quite yet. You can also see what's coming up in the next week or so. Pull that back up. So here's the week, April 5th to April 11th. And here are all the future assignments set up. So use this to put dates in your calendars and figure out how to plan for that. The rest of the page, here's your Zoom chat link. I put up a course calendar. This is just from the syllabus. This has all of our course topics, the venue in which the material will be presented. So notice our first Zoom chat is Tuesday, April 14th. And the reading I want you to do before lecture, as well as the associated homework. You will notice that we have something due every class day, which is twice a week. That's because all the points you would normally get for in-class writing or for participation or attendance, all that stuff, has got has kind of rolled into those shorter assignments. I'm going to talk about the individual assignment categories later on in this lecture, but I want you to make make you aware of those deadlines. So as you are putting stuff in your calendar, you may just want to write down the homework assignments as well and get ready for those. Um, they vary in points. Obviously, the ones with, the, with more points are longer. The other useful section is lecture notes and homework. There's a lot of material here. What I've done is organize this by week. So I've gone through every one of our nine weeks. Nine weeks go really, really fast. And I have for each week the reading, any links that you need. So here's the course syllabus under week one, and then the assignments for that week. So you click through here to go to the syllabus quiz, and you click through here to submit your self evaluation number one. That pattern will repeat all the way down here, and there are also some general links on writing and grammar. Um, I have templates in here to write an MLA or APA. You can build your citations, a very useful tool there. There are sample papers. And whether you're using Microsoft Word or Google Docs, here's a starting point so you can have the, the formatting done in your all your homework. I would recommend just starting with one of these, keeping it handy, and just changing up the titles and everything as you go through there. The other categories are for our major papers, which I'll talk about later on. This just has sample papers, instructions, and drop boxes for the Rough and final draft. And then uh, see our, our course syllabus and send email. You want to go to get in touch with me, go to all instructor users. Um, I don't think you'll need to get in touch with each other since we're not doing actual in class work, but you can do that here as well. So there's a lot of stuff on Blackboard. And I think that will cover most of the questions that come up during. Course. So if you can't find something on the syllabus or on Blackboard, then please let me know. Let me also go over some policies. These are on your syllabus, but I want to make sure I'm clear about how they work. If you have any questions, then let me know. The syllabus quiz will include something on these policies. So most of the class meetings will be video lectures. 
Uh, I will put these up on, I'm going to decide to do Numeo or YouTube. Either way, you'll get a link on Blackboard to those. Five times during this quarter, we will have full class discussion sections on Zoom. I'm teaching two sections of this course. So I'll do one session from 10 to 11.50 a.m. and another session from 2 to 3.50 p.m. Some of those will combine lecture and discussion, but a lot of it will just be you guys talking. Because that is an important part of the quarter, if you miss one of those sessions without an excused absence, so you know, if you get sick or get an emergency or something, let me know, we can work with that. You can only earn half credit for that day's homework assignment. That can cost you a lot of points, so make sure you attend those if at all possible. When you submit your papers on Blackboard, first of all, please just send them on Blackboard. We have everything set up there. And please send them in Microsoft Word format. If you use pages format, I will not be able to read them. And I will have to send you a quick email saying, help, I cannot see what you're trying to say here. I really don't want to give you a zero, so please send me the document in Word format. Um, it also needs to be in Word for me to use the online markup on Blackboard, which is how I grade the rough drafts. So I want all the papers there. Please don't just email me things because I get a lot of emails every single day and it's easy for me to overlook, oh, you actually did turn that in. I have to give you credit for that there. So we'll just keep everything on Blackboard if we can. In terms of late papers, do your best to turn everything in on time um, for the homework assignments, which is basically everything except the major papers. You can earn half credit, um, again, unless you have a genuine emergency, and the sooner you can get in touch with me about that, the better. You have 72 hours um, to submit late homework to get that half credit. And I, I do want to clarify, that doesn't mean that you automatically get half the points. That means that if it's worth 20 points um, and when you turn it in, you earned 18 of those points, then I take the 10 for the original, 10, 10 points off from the original late penalty and you get eight out of 20. So it's better than a zero, but it's a, it's a pretty stiff penalty. So you do want to turn those in early if you can, or on time if you can. For our major papers, you're going to do those in two stages. For the rough drafts, they are worth, uh, I believe, 50 points a piece. So that's 5% of your course grade. And they need to be in within 24 hours of the due date to get credit and to get my feedback. I do that because I have you know, two classes of 26 I think, students each. That is a lot of drafts to turn around in roughly the week, week and a half that I have between the rough draft and the, the feedback conferences, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So I start grading those immediately. I grade them in the order they come in. And so if I get something three or four days into that process, then it's really hard for me to get enough feedback on that to put that in my schedule. Um, and so, I do get those within 24 hours, or you just lose those points. For the final drafts, it's a little more straightforward. You just lose 20 points for each day your paper is late. So if, assuming you start with a, a perfect score, 150 points a week on the first paper um, for the final draft, and you still write a perfect paper, good job, but you turn it in a day late, then you have 130. So it's not going to doom you for the entire quarter, but it will make a dent in your grade. Again, please get in touch if you have a genuine emergency on those. All right, that does it for our course policies. You can go to your syllabus to find the details on that. Next, I want to talk you through kind of my teaching philosophy, my idea for arguing like a grown-up, because I think this is an important approach in any writing class, no matter what sort of content we're producing. And so it's something that I've been developing for all my classes. And I wanna go through these five key practices for doing that. The reason I set this up is because I want you to be able to produce clear, 
consistent and mature arguments. If you've spent any amount of time in public, especially on social media and <clears throat> Twitter, you know that there are lots and lots of really bad arguments. And they're not always bad because the evidence is presented clumsily or because there needs to be a source cited or even because the person didn't analyze the audience very well. They're bad because a lot of people have decided to try to bypass the argument, to just post a meme, to say, there, I proved that you're an idiot or that you don't need to be listened to or you quoted from the New York Times or Fox News or CNN or whatever you want to label fake news these days. And therefore, nothing you say can be trustworthy. This is what gets us to talk past each other, to yell at each other rather than talking to each other. Now, these principles do apply, I think, in how we treat each other. This is as much about ethics as it is about writing and argument. But the fact is we do a lot of our arguments in writing, especially online. Now, we don't have the sarcasm font yet on Facebook. In fact, I got myself into a lot of trouble in certain Facebook groups because I would post a sarcastic response, usually mocking the other side, and someone would accuse me of being on the other side because they didn't figure out that I was not being completely serious there. We have the advantage of lots of nonverbal signals, body language. We have ways to change our tone of voice to say, yes, I'm really being serious here, not. And we can't do that in a lot of writing. So starting with these practices is a good way to set up a more useful ground for disagreements, as well as for agreeing with each other productively. The other reason I set this up is because after college, if not already, you will have a job. Maybe right now it doesn't look like it, but there, there will be jobs again in the future, I promise. And those of you who've already been working full-time or even part-time somewhere, know that the colleagues and the coworkers that are hardest to get along with are the ones who kind of mm, bypass maturity and civility. Because in any job, you're gonna have bad days. You're gonna have those days where you really don't even wanna go to work. You don't wanna deal with these people's crap one minute more than you have to, especially if you are in a customer facing position. And it's how you respond in those situations that will often set you apart. How do you deal with those disagreements with your coworkers? How do you figure out what to do when that staff member is really pissing you off? That is going to get you noticed for good or for ill. And that's going to have a substantial impact on how people decide to hire you or promote you or kind of treat you at work. Let me go through these five practices. The first one is to acknowledge complexity. The basic idea here, and it should be already clear to anyone who studies science for a living, is that any single thing that we study is way more complicated than we realize, especially the things that are created by human beings, arguments, texts, models, equations, because we are messy critters, also kind of messed up, but we're messy at least. And this means that we're never going to have a perfect view of any issue, no matter how strong, how well thought out your opinions are, how many times you've had these arguments, there's always gonna be something about the issue that you haven't considered. And there are gonna be blind spots. Um, back at Ohio State, I had the chance to teach a course called The Bible's Literature a couple of times. It's a fun course to teach because I have distinct groups that come into every single one of those classes. I always have a group of students who is sort of 
vaguely familiar with the Bible. Maybe they went to church when they were a kid. Maybe they went to Catholic high school or something. And so they know some of the stories. And they come in pretty much thinking, I don't really need to do a lot of the reading or a lot of the homework because, hey, I've, I've done this already. And they assume certain things about what's in the Bible, what's not in the Bible, and how it works. I have a second group. Um, often these are religious studies majors. And they generally have decided that the Bible is important, but not authoritative in any sense, moral or theological or otherwise. And so they come in trying to debunk everything. And so they, they're the ones who always want to be skeptical and critical. And they also come in with their set of assumptions about what the Bible says and means and how it can be used. And then I have a group of uh, devout religious students, often Christians, because it's a, generally a Christian book. And they know parts of the Bible really, really well. And they read it in a different way than their, their classmates. They hold it to be authoritative in a different way than their classmates. They re react very differently to criticism of any sort. But they share something with their classmates. They also think they kind of know what's going on in the Bible and what it is and what it isn't. And so what I do first day of class, every time I teach that course, is I hold up the Bible, our textbook, and I say there's way, way more in this than we can ever hope to cover in one class. None of us, myself included, will understand the complexity and the subtlety and all the context in here, especially not at the pace that we have to cover all this material. And I want to make a similar argument in this class. Even in the, the small selections representing just a few scientific disciplines, a few authors, a few topics that we're going to read as a class, there's way more going on than we will cover in a whole year's worth of discussions. And so I want to encourage you, as you approach issues like this, Start by thinking about that complexity. Figure out how can you break something down? How does the argument work? Whether that's fiction, nonfiction, or it's a creative text, scientific article, how has the author organized this? And what difference does that make in how we interpret or understand it? Also to approach this with a certain level of humility. You can be a very, very smart person, very well-educated person. I have had the privilege of working with a lot of very smart people in my editing business and in my teaching. And I found that the more advanced they get, the smarter they are, the more they realize the limits of what they actually know and how much there is to learn about this. Now, when you're making an argument, one of the attractive it's honestly sometimes the most fun fallacy to indulge in it's called the straw man and what this is is taking the absolute weakest caricature the the exaggerated stupid version of your opponent's viewpoint and demolishing it so you, you build the straw man a scarecrow and you say look how weak and how stupid and how ignorant this is I'm going to just obliterate it. And then you stand back and say, aha, I win. Well, it can be fun, but it doesn't actually get us anywhere in terms of having a conversation or making a good argument. Because you end up with arguments like, well, let's say we have a complicated social or political issue like immigration. Always a hot button issue here in California. Now, you could take the time and put in the effort into narrowing down your focus and figuring out what exactly you want to argue and looking at the data and understanding, figure out how do I understand this, how do I interpret this data, and making a measured, careful analysis and saying, this is why I believe the wall is a good idea or a bad idea, and here's how we should understand this. But that takes time and effort, and it's kind of boring. So. Instead, you could say, you know what, if you want to 
if you favor the wall, you hate brown people. And at that point, the argument's over, not because you won, not because you lost, because you've decided that it's not going to be about the issue, it's going to be about that straw man. It's going to be assuming this is what people who disagree with me are like, and this is how I'm going to defeat them. It doesn't really help us any. So you want to understand the argument as thoroughly as you can before you respond. I want you to think about both the content, what's in the argument, and the context. When, where, and how do they make that? We'll come back to those ideas later on this quarter. Also want to be explicit about what you're trying to do in your argument. The scope, how broad or narrow, and the goals are going to influence a lot of elements here. And there's a little bit of counterintuitive part to this. Many students, and I was, I was like this, you know, when I first started studying writing, they look at the assignment and say, oh no, how am I ever going to fill a thousand, two thousand, five thousand words on anything? I have to talk about as much as I possibly can because otherwise I'm going to run out of things to say. And I get it. I have done that. When I started the largest writing project of my life, a dissertation, I was like, 291 page book. I had all these ideas and I thought I'm going to have to cover all these different novels because it was in literature and all these different concepts and all these different theories so I can fill the space. Because my professors told me you need a 50 page chapter on each of these books. And I thought I've, I've got to do everything. But what I actually found was that as I narrowed, the more I narrowed down what I wanted to write about, what I was interested in, the easier it was to make those arguments. Because I didn't have to worry nearly as much about how am I going to make space for all the stuff I have to say? How am I going to connect all this together and say, you know what? I'm going to limit myself to making these arguments at this time for these reasons. And I'm going to give myself permission to say, there's a lot more I could talk about and I'm not gonna do it. And I want you to give yourself that permission because you're gonna need it no matter how long the paper. Our second practice is to focus on ideas, not on feelings. Now, I love teaching college students because you guys are so passionate about everything, especially at the freshman comp level, the 107 get so many students who just want to change the world in five pages and I like the impulse it's the five pages that I have a, a problem with so what I want you to encourage you to do is to use what you're passionate about what you care about hopefully that connects in some way to your major or the job you want to have but I want you to use that to form good ideas because a lot of good arguments, a lot of effective arguments are going to appeal to emotion in some way. But especially in the classroom, the foundation should be specific claims defended by specific evidence. And if this sounds like sixth grade English, it's supposed to. We harp on this for most of your writing education because it keeps on being important. The trouble is if you rely exclusively or even predominantly on feelings, whether those are your own or your audiences, you get to that point where you're no longer making an argument, you're just trying to elicit that emotion. And this is how memes work. Not so much, you know, the, the funny memes with the cats wearing neckties and saying, I have a business meeting or something more clever than that. But the kinds you see on the social pages and on the political pages, with the scary picture and the yellow text on the black background, you've all seen these. And they're not designed to make sustained responsible arguments. They're designed to make you feel very strongly for or against something, whether that is a politician or a policy or a party or something like that. And they generally do their job at the expense of any sort of discussion. And so if you happen to wander into a corner of the internet with more than one political viewpoint represented, then you'll see a lot of memes 
that are used to end arguments and not in the positive way of we have completed our discussion, the negative way of I don't want to talk to you anymore. What I want you to do instead, use emotion as a rhetorical tool. Figure out what is causing it and what is it doing and use that to convince your audience. Now, there may not be a whole lot of room for emotion in a lab report. If you're taking chemistry or biology or physics, then it's not, there's not a lot of room in the numbers. But think about other ways that we can communicate science. Right now, we have a dizzy number of public health messages. And some of them focus on just the facts in terms of, of COVID-19, I mean. Some of them are just, hey, you should wash your hands more. Here's how you should wash your hands. Here's how long you should take. Here's the kind of, the kind of soap you should use. But a lot of them say, we're doing this to protect people, to protect your family, to protect your grandparents, to protect maybe your kids. And that brings in the emotion. And it can do it well, it can do it badly. But it is an important part of our arguments. I just don't want it to be the main thing that you're using in your classes here. But to do this well, you've got to be honest with yourself. We all have hot button issues, and we all have certain emotional commitments. There are topics and texts and ideas that I love arguing about in my free time that I would never bring into a classroom because it would not be fair. Plus, most of my students would not be that interested in them. And there are ways that I approach any topic or any argument with certain people that I know it's just going to be different than with anyone else. So if I am on campus, you know, if I'm talking to my colleagues or something, and we disagree on a certain thing, I might pursue that argument and go back and forth with them and, you know, maybe get a little excited, a little heated and go through that. Whereas if I have the same disagreement with my wife, I'm probably going to think, do I really want to fight about this? No, I probably don't. And I'll find another way to approach that conversation. That's just how we work as humans. So there can be a value to establishing a certain level of emotional distance from a topic or an argument. That might mean picking topics that are more neutral for you. But it also could be just having this attitude of, you know what, I want to learn more about this and I want to express my ideas better rather than I want to own the other side. This comes to our third principle, using evidence clearly and honestly. I love this quote from Thomas Sowell. He's an economist and a political theorist. He wrote, facts do not speak for themselves. They speak for or against competing theories. Facts divorced from theories or visions are mere isolated curiosities. And I love that phrase, isolated curiosities, because he works with math for a living. He's an economist. He could quote you hundreds of facts about how people buy and sell products, how pricing works, how a certain trend is going to show up in certain economic data. He has a book called Basic Economics that is 600 pages long. He knows his facts. But he also knows that only giving those facts without some sort of rhetorical context is not going to be nearly as effective. It's not going to be helpful unless we have some place to hang those. One thing we'll look at later on is how different elements of a rhetorical situation can influence our use of evidence. So audience, context, genre are all going to be important. Who are we talking to? What are we saying to them and with what way are we presenting this? And what sort of ways are we using to organize our messages? That's all gonna make a big difference. And so as you are 
deciding what evidence to use, always a big part of any scientific, scientific inquiry. Ask yourself how this functions in your argument and why you want to use that. And that will mean, how does this work in the original? Who is quoting what and why? Um, I had a student several years back in Ohio. She was writing a research paper on gay marriage, which is like the number, back then was probably the number two most popular topic for writing classes. And she had a quote in there, and it, well, the sentence in her paper was something like this. According to Focus on the Family, homosexuality is a completely normal and moral practice. And I read that sentence, and I thought, that doesn't sound like Focus on the Family. Focus on the Family, as you may know, is a very politically and religiously conservative Christian group. And so it, it was really out of character for them to say that. And so I looked up the source. Fortunately, she had cited it in her bibliography. So I pulled up the article, and here's what had happened. The author for Focus on the Family had quoted someone else, who quoted in this case the American Psychological Association, the APA, who said homosexuality is a completely normal and moral process. And then the author, writing for Focus on the Family, spent the entire article saying, here's why they're wrong. So the quote not only was misattributed, but actually was actually completely flipped on its head. Now, I don't know if the student just didn't realize what was going on or wanted to say, look, everyone agrees with me or something like that, but it hurt her credibility because she was not grappling with the evidence honestly. But as you do your research, you want to look at evidence from multiple perspectives. It is perfectly fine. It can be, it can be really helpful to disagree with your sources. It's a scary prospect, I get it. You're reading stuff by people sometimes with multiple PhDs who've been thinking about these topics for years if not decades. And here you are, two weeks, if that, into your research project and saying, aha, I know better than you. And it, it sounds a little silly when you say it out loud like that. But I want to hear your ideas and your voices this quarter, not just here's what I found that other people have said. Part of that is our fourth principle, take opposing viewpoints seriously. One thing we'll look at later this quarter is forming arguments. In fact, our next, next lecture will be on forming arguments. A good principle there is that the more specific you get in the claims and the more complex your argument is, the more opportunity people will have to disagree with you. And that's a little bit of a scary prospect as well because we want people to like us. We want to say, look, the sky out there, it's blue. And everyone will say, oh yes, yes, definitely, definitely shade of blue, uh huh? Uh, we, we like this person, we like blue. And we've accomplished exactly nothing in that entire argument. And so this may require stepping outside of your comfort zone a little bit, figuring out can, excuse me, can someone legitimately disagree with me? And what would that look like? How do I deal with that disagreement? How do I show that this is still the best way to account for the data? This is an ethical practice because it does go back to some of the earlier principles, acknowledging complexity, and using evidence clearly and honestly, but it's also about the people behind the arguments. How do we treat them? Do we show respect? Do we deride them? Do we show derision? Do we say, well, you wouldn't understand this because you're not intelligent enough, or you're the wrong religion or race or political persuasion to really understand this issue? One of my other students, um, who's also writing her paper on gay marriage, uh, came to me for a, a research conference, an individual research meeting um, several years ago. And in this particular assignment, um, I asked my students to write about some issue that they that made a personal difference in their lives, because honestly, I wanted to avoid the big political topics. And she said, I want to write about gay marriage. I said, well, okay, let's, you know, let's talk about this. Um, 
why is this important to you? And she gave me a little bit about her history and her family's history and showed that there was a connection there. So I said, okay, so what, what do you want to argue? And she had a, a very, very pro gay marriage approach to the issue. And she told me why she thought that and what she wanted to do with her paper and told me about some of the sources she had read. And I said, okay, I, I think you've got a really good grasp of one side of the issue. But I also want you to read sources that disagree with you. I want you to look at, in this case, the conservative views. I want you to see how are they arguing to help you figure out what's the best way to put together your argument. And I pulled up a couple of sources because it's not the first time it's students have written about this topic. And I said, take a look at some of these. Tell me what you think you could do with some of this in terms of making a more complex, more nuanced argument. And she looked right at me and she said, why would I read that bullshit? And I did something I don't do often. I said, let's find you a new research topic. Because I had no doubt that she could make a thorough argument defending her position. I also had no doubt that she would not learn anything in the process because she'd already made up her mind to the point that she was not even willing to entertain other viewpoints. Now, fortunately, most of the students I encounter are a little more flexible in that sense, but it is an issue that comes up in classes like this a lot. So you have to be willing to take your opposition seriously, even if it just means understanding them well enough to criticize them more effectively. So go back to our principles, be respectful of the other side, but also be rigorous in how you respond to them and how you argue. Because I want you to understand this well enough to have that discussion, not just to say, well, here are the five reasons why I'm right, everyone else, go away. The last principle in this model is the bedrock. Respect everyone's right to free speech. We have the privilege in this country of having free speech constitutionally enshrined. And in the university, it should be the starting point. Because if you come to Cal State and you spend four years here and you only hear the same ideas and viewpoints and perspectives that you heard in high school, you should ask for your money back. They're not going to give it to you, but you should ask for your money back anyway. Because dealing with disagreements, dealing with opposition, that's how you grow as an intellectual, as a student, and as a person. Some of those ideas are going to be wrong. <laughs> Even some of the ideas you read in your textbooks, your professors tell you, are going to be wrong. But you've got to start there to figure out what's the better way, what's the right way to approach this. On one hand, I think we should have an open view of free speech. But I also want you to have a smart view of free speech. Because you don't have freedom from the consequences of what you say. Right now, we don't have, well, we don't have a lot of freedoms, but in particular, um, we have certain practices that are limited by fiat, by government decree, um, in terms of how we can gather, when we can do that, how often we can do that. But imagine, way back in the long ago time of, what was it, February or so, when we could actually, you know, meet in groups and go to public places and stuff. Imagine you were back on Cal State's campus and you went out to the middle of that nice greenish quad area and you started screaming, hey, we have to kill all of the, and it really doesn't matter what noun you put at the end there. You're gonna get some attention, probably from the campus police, possibly from the counseling center, and depending on how you react to those attentions, potentially from the city of San Bernardino Police Department. And you probably should get that attention. Because just because you are able legally to say something doesn't necessarily mean you should say something. So be smart in how you present your arguments and how you respond to others' arguments. 
I hope that we will have good arguments, good disagreements this quarter. But I hope that we can approach those respectfully, not just because that's how we treat other people, but because this is a part of how we can argue, how we can do things in the US. I want to finish up with the wisdom of XKCD. Some point, someone is going to be wrong on the internet. It's a scary process. But you have two choices. You can tell them exactly how wrong they are, why they're wrong, and all the ways you're right. Or you can say, you know what? I'm going to let you be wrong. Sometimes you need to walk away from the argument. Sometimes that's the most mature thing you can do. So those are the principles I hope that we will model in our interactions this quarter. I don't do them perfectly. You don't do them perfectly either, but they're a starting point. We're going to break here. Um, been talking at you for a while. So I'm going to end the video here. Um, take some time to go over the course syllabus. If you still have questions about how things work, please email them to me. I'd be glad to respond to those. I'll be back in the next video to talk about our assignments and to kind of go over some techniques for that. See you then.